uh, now we have a comparative study of two techniques. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure and I'm very honored of being here. Today I will talk to you about class two correction with Invisalign and with carrier motion appliance. We developed a research protocol in order to support from a scientific point of view the use of Invisalign aligners in class two treatment in non-growing patients. Frequently, the stylization of maxillary molars is required in class two non-extraction patients and may be appropriate in those cases with maxillary dental velar protrusion or minor skeletal discrepancies. The upper molars can be distalized by means of extra or intraoral forces. Several techniques have been proposed to reduce patient compliance, such as intraoral uh, appliances with and without skeletal anchorage. However, even these devices can produce undesirable tipping of the maxillary molars and loss of anterior anchorage during distalization. In recent years, increasing number of adult patients have sought orthodontic treatment and expressed a desire for aesthetic and comfortable alternatives to fixed appliances. But let's see how can we move teeth from a biomechanical point of view? The so-called pressure tension theory has been considered the state of art for ages, and several studies have joined this approach in association with the application of a light constant force. In a finite element analysis, the School of Ours in Denmark demonstrated that even applying a light constant force on a tooth, the occlusal contacts occurring during the normal daily functions and the viscoelastic properties of the periodontal ligament result in tension and pressure areas scattered along the root surface that they did not confirm the classical idea of distinct and symmetrical compressive and tensile areas, and light continuous forces are perceived as intermittent by the periodontum. Thus are intermittent the forces who move teeth. With Invisalign, we release intermittent forces on the teeth we want to move. Thanks to the group of Dr. Schwartz, we know that forces and moments generated by Invisalign aligners for molar distalization are consistent with the data published in relation to fixed appliances, are biologically correct, can produce bone modeling with less cell damage than continuous forces. In this study, we compared the dental skeletal effects of Invisalign thermoplastic aligners and carrier motion appliance in distalizing maxillary molars. Aligners cannot release constant light force due to the removability of the appliance, and the same situation occurs with carrier motion because the removability of class two elastics too, so the released distalizing forces are intermittent ones. We excluded the patient with transversal and vertical dental skeletal discrepancies, extraction treatment except for third molars, unilateral distalization, signs and symptoms of uh, TMDs, periodontal disease, endodontic treatments, and prosthodontic rehabilitation for the maxillary molars. We included patients with half cast molar class two, maxillary dental velar protrusion, required molar distalization more than 1.5 millimeters, normal divergence on the vertical plane, and patients aged more than 18 years old. 70 lateral cell phalograms were considered for the study. In the group one, we had 20 non-growing subjects at the beginning and the end of their Invisalign orthodontic treatment. In the group two, we had 15 non-growing subjects of the, uh, at the beginning and the end of their carrier motion appliance orthodontic treatment. To evaluate the dental skeletal effects, we used the same cephalometric analysis proposed by Bailoff in 1997 to measure the pendulum dental skeletal outcomes. Thus, the movements of several points of the upper molars and central incisor or crowns and roots were measured on the sagittal plane with respect to a vertical line passing through the rickets PT point perpendicular to the palatal plane, and on the vertical plane with respect to the palatal plane and to the occlusal plane. 
As indicators of skeletal vertical dimension changes, we consider the palatal plane mandibular plane angle and the SN mandibular plane angle. From a previous study we carried on, we enrolled 30 subjects that were treated with Invisalign in order to obtain a class one relationship. Inclusion and exclusion criteria and cephalometric analysis were the same described before. Subjects were divided into two groups, 16 patients with five attachments and 14 patients with three attachments, only on premolars and first molar. And we found that in the group with five attachments, there were bodily movement of second molar, first molar, and central incisor. In the group with three attachments, there were bodily movement of second molar, tipping for the first molar and central incisor, and a greater anchorage loss. In the study we are talking of today, we used five attachments on all of the distalizing teeth, and the patients were asked to wear aligners for uh, 22 hours per day and class two elastics from the beginning of the first molar movement. The mean treatment time was around 24 months. Patients with carrier motion appliance were instructed to wear elastics 22 hours per day, so except when eating, because of the vertical force vector that opened in the mouth while chewing outcomes. For the first months, elastics were six ounces, second and following months, eight ounces. Whether using the second or the first lower molar as anchorage, average treatment time was six months. And let's see the results. For group one, that is patients treated with Invisalign aligners on the left, uh, significant, significant changes in the sagittal position of upper first and second molar with a bodily movement of about 2.25 millimeters for the first molar measured on the mesocosp occurred. This movement, movement was not associated with uh, intrusion or extrusion or tipping movement. For group two, on the right, patients treated with the carrier motion appliance, a significant distalization movement of maxillary first and second molars was observed as well, of about 1.86 1, 1 millimeter for the first molar measure cusp, but a significant distal crown tipping for first molar occurred of about six degrees. A clockwise rotation of the mandible due to premature contact may worsen the profile and cause bite opening. The distal movement measured in this study was not associated with extrusion and as a consequence, there were no changes in the lower fascial aid. This may, may be explained with the bite block effect due to the thickness of the aligners. In conclusion, the aim of this retrospective study was to compare dental skeletal effects in distalizing maxillary molars with Invisalign and carrier motion appliance. Results indicate the possibility of distalization of upper molars and no vertical fascia changes with both the techniques, providing a significant amount of tipping for first molar with the use of carrier motion appliance. So let's summarize pros and cons. With Invisalign, we use just one technique to distalize and, and align. With carrier motion, we need one more appliance to complete the treatment. With Invisalign, we actually don't have tipping for first molars, but with carrier motion, we sensibly reduce a long-lasting treatment as class two correction is. So we chart the uh, suggestion from our work. We could say that it would be better to enlarge our sample size and so further investigation should be carried on. But if both techniques considered for this study work in distalizing maxillary molars without changes in lower fascial height, and we have good tip back control with Invisalign and a shorter treatment time with carrier motion appliance, we think that it would be a great idea to use them together. Thank you. Thank you.